legal, liberty, and social justice issue, issues that impact all Canadians, what we need to know and want to talk about. And today, we are joined by two of you. <laughs> we have nothing Both to do Both of today. you, <laughs> Joseph Newberger and Stacey Nichols, and that's because we have some important cases to talk about, starting with yeah. uh, the Sami Yatin case. Well, we both uh, watched uh, the video which was played and um, had uh, read the editorials mm -hmm. on it. So it's quite an interesting, uh, as it was reported, um, we haven't seen something like that occur in a criminal case in a very long time, uh, uh, anything of that nature. And it, I think it's important to say that in a, in a jury trial, any type of evidence, like a demonstrative type of evidence, a video, a reenactment, really plays well with a jury because a jury loves the excitement and the drama mm -hmm. of it. The problem is it has to be really helpful, and um, I obviously I'm not second guessing the defense strategy mm -hmm. because the defense obviously knows the case much better than we do. But um, it, I thought the testimony of the officer was going in rather well in and of itself, especially when you take a look at the video of uh, Mr. Yatim at the time when he was quite erratic and with the knife. And at some point, I've always had the uh, tactic that I find simplicity has its own elegance and it's a, a better way to play with the jury and sometimes you know there's the saying and we'll make it non-gender but you know you doth protest too much so when you go overboard and are trying to portray yourself and you've got the eyes wide open and trying to play the actual victim in this there could be a negative impact to that on your own credibility so I you know it's an interesting tactic um, I wasn't in love with it, but you know it may play well in front of the jury. I don't know, Stacey. So, so what you're saying is basically sometimes less is best. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And again, there obviously is some strategy behind it that we may not know about. But you know, of course, being much younger than Joseph, I certainly have. Ne <laughs> <laughs> I certainly have never seen uh, a, a just you know a video like that being used during the course of an accused testimony. So very interesting, and we'll see how it plays out. Well, so you're, you're, you're basically saying that in, in, in other situations that you may have tried, you would have found this overkill. I, if I was defending the case, and again, I'm not familiar with all of the evidence, I don't think I would have done my own home-style video with him playing the victim, trying to amplify the actions and the, the expressions and, I guess, the intensity of what Mr. Yatim was presenting at that time. I think it's pretty obvious from the videos that were captured that he was a menace to mm -hmm. the people on the on the uh, train and um, or streetcar, and he was clearly a danger. There's no doubt about that. And the proximity of the officer to Ma Mr. Yatim was not that far, mm -hmm. and he was standing there. The officer was standing there alone. So it, it it's not a far stretch that he would feel threatened in those circumstances. Given especially since I understand from his testimony. Prior to that day, has never fired his weapon. Yeah, I was just so, going to say that's that. A, that's a big. That's thing. a big it thing is. for me. It's not mm -hmm. like this guy was a nervous uh, Nelly. I mean, he. Yeah. Right. And there was another video that was shown during the course of the trial where he undertook an arrest of two accused drug. It was a drug situation uh, where they were armed, and you know he took them down safely without using his weapon at all. So I think that's an important piece of evidence as well, to yeah. show how he performed in other circumstances, obviously under well, stress. not a guns a blazing guy. Right. right. Yeah. No, and, and I think we discussed this before, that, you know, I, I can't imagine he attended with any intent to, to, to shoot this individual and kill him. This was a situation that was unfolding rather rapidly for him in circumstances which he believed were quite dangerous. It's a question of measuring his actions and whether they were beyond what was necessary in order to subdue Mr. Yatim. And, and I think really what it comes down to are the two volleys of bullets. Because there's, uh, you know, um, a series of shots, which right. I think are four. Then there's a break, some more orders um, uh, directed to Mr. Yatim, and then another volley of shots. That's where I think the issue is going to come in. And, and we'll see. I don't know if this video would have helped that. It may have no damage whatsoever either, or it may really help the jury. I, I don't know. It's not something I think we would have engaged in. So I'm going to ask you a question, and you can refuse to answer and say that you're not. <laughs> you can take the fifth on this. But as lawyers who who sort of 
are doing cases like this all the time, maybe not this particular thing, but criminal cases all the time. Do you have a sense uh, of what the outcome will be? <laughs> you don't have to say what it is because that might be prejudicial, but do you have a, well maybe not because they're not allowed to watch anything, but mm -hmm. do you have a sense in, do you have a feeling of well, where this is going to go? I mean, it's, it's unusual in the first place that an officer would have been charged with murder yeah. in these circumstances. I mean, that doesn't happen very often. Um, my sense, my sense is that he, he'll be convicted. Of? Well, I don't necessarily <laughs> think that he'll be not convicted of, no, uh, no. Not a second degree Not murder. a second degree murder, no. I, I think probably the most appropriate would be manslaughter. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm not, I think what the jury's going to have to grapple with is what was going on at, what was his reaction, was it appropriate uh, when he first um, released uh, his weapon and, and fired on Mr. Yatim? And then I think the second volley is what they're going to have to look at very carefully. I, I just don't think intent to uh, commit murder is anywhere near mm -hmm. this case. I think no. it's just a question of excessive force in the circumstances of what was appropriate to subdue Mr. Yatim. And I think it's a very unfortunate circumstance for Mr. Yatim, very unfortunate for this officer. It really is a tragedy all around because, again, this is an officer who didn't come to, to harm anybody. He was there to protect the public. Yeah. And that's something we have to keep in mm -hmm. mind. So it's a very sensitive case. It's very tragic from both ends, and you know, it, the jury will have some very difficult issues to uh, mm -hmm. to uh, to yeah, review. Exactly, because it, the problem too is that in the U.S. we're seeing all this stuff go on. Right. Yeah. Uh, where we're we're bringing in racial motives and 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 other and and there's been a lot of it. So the public has been exposed to that. We're particular. We're all a little sensitive about it. But on the other hand, you, you take a human being who may be trained, but then in s suddenly in a situation, mm -hmm. uh, right. and we don't all react the same way. Exactly. And, and it's going back later uh, mm -hmm. than going, to, uh, oh, 2020. Yeah, I you know. didn't do what yep. you should have done. Right. And I, I mean, it's, it's well known, and hopefully this is going to change, but I, I don't know that the police are properly trained when it comes to de-escalation techniques, especially in relation to mentally disordered accused. Uh, and, and we see that, I mean, we've, we've seen lots of cases and even talked on this show about a, a yes. couple of cases mm -hmm. in that regard. So. But, you know, we are a far cry from what's going on in the United States. It is oh, not, no, no, no. Oh, we, are, yeah. we are, we are. There's no are, racial element to this. You know, this is, there's that are. other case we discussed, I think the Chicago shooting with 16 yes. bullets. You know, there's just no comparison. No, no, I know, but yeah. I, I think just the public in general, yeah. we hear it through the media. We Everybody do. Everybody does. So everybody's a little sensitized to it about what's going on with these cops. Yeah. I think so. But, you know, again, you know, having done a lot of jury trials, I find our juries, when they're properly instructed, really do a good job to try and disabuse themselves of all that other noise right. mm -hmm. and really to focus on what's going on. And I think Canadians have a really good sense that we still live within a very good system here. And, and, and they have to gauge this case within that context. So, Well, moving on to Dennis Olin's second-degree murder trial. Right. What's going on there? Stace? Well, he just finished testifying in his own defense, as I understand it, having been accused, obviously, back in 2000, mm -hmm. 2013 of murdering his father quite violently in his father's office. I think there were there were some questions that seemed in the media um, about whether or not he should have testified in his own defense. Um, I think in these circumstances, again, similarly, I don't know everything about the case, but in these circumstances, it seemed to me that he didn't have much choice, given you know given the la that he was the last one to see his father alive, mm -hmm. purportedly, and you know given the DNA that was found on his sport jacket that was seized by the police, uh, it seemed to me that he had some explaining to do, and and he. And that's what what happened. He testified. That's a tricky. Is, that seems to be a tricky thing for people to to testify in their own defense, isn't it? It's always a, it's always a crucial point for lawyers. It seems to be because there's yeah. always a commentary on that, always after a trial mm -hmm. about whether they should have or they shouldn't have. It's either, you yeah. know, a, a, you know, a great coup or it isn't. Right. Yeah, I think. It, you know, in my early days of practice, um, I was very, very careful about when to call a client to testify. And then as things developed, the Court of Appeal had said, you know, in cases when there's an appeal of a conviction, uh, you're in a better position in appeal if an accused does testify. 
um, and and you have to assess your client and the evidence. You know, if there's an overwhelming uh, difficulty with the Crown's case, if the credibility of key Crown witnesses has been severely damaged on cross-examination, then you don't want to call your client to rehabilitate the Crown's case at all. So you won't do it. But in cases where there's close calls, and this is a difficult case, I think a jury will want to hear from this individual to say, I didn't do it, this is the jacket I was wearing, here's mm -hmm. what happened, here's where I was. I think it's imperative in cases like that. I think it was the right call for this individual to testify. And, and you know, uh, same as in the case with this officer. I mean, you've got, you know, uniquely mm -hmm. in two uh, murder cases, you have both defendants testifying, and uh, it's important for the jury to hear in this particular case. Now we'd like to talk about something that may have an impact, uh, certainly across this province, which is that mental health records, records from police street checks known as carding, can no longer be disclosed in police record checks in Ontario. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll just take mm -hmm. the lead on that for a second. Absolutely. So this includes also any records of non-convictions. So what does this, what does that mean exactly? Okay, this is really, really important, and this is a great piece of legislation, and people will have to pay careful attention to this because I applaud the government for this. This okay. is major. So we represent, you know, hundreds of clients, and uh, cases get withdrawn or they're acquitted at trial, but the records don't disappear. The records are still within databases. Some police services delete, but in many cases the records are kept, even though the person is found not guilty or the charges are withdrawn. And, and a withdrawal is based on the fact that there's no reasonable prospect of conviction, meaning that the Crown does not have a case that they could present Or to they convict. have no evidence. Or they have mm -hmm. no evidence. So the person is innocent. However, the re what could happen up until now is if you're applying for a job, and we have clients who... Um, want to work within various industries, banking, insurance industry, somewhere where you're bonded, high level positions, mm -hmm. and a criminal record check is done and you get the outstanding charge or you get a copy uh, showing that the charge was dismissed and they'll never get the job because the record is disclosed. This piece of legislation will now deal comprehensively, hopefully, with all of those records that they cannot be disclosed by the police to anybody who's inquiring about them because they're highly prejudicial and it's discriminatory against somebody. We don't discriminate against people who are found not guilty of an offense. Mm -hmm. And that's what's been happening in this province for a long time. And it's been a major problem for clients because we say to them at the end of the day, I'm sorry, I can't change their policy. If you want, we can sue. We can start an action on your behalf, but they don't have 100000 or $200,000 to battle the government. And somebody yeah, has. Yeah. But this is an excellent piece of legislation which will bring fairness back to the system, I hope. Well, you know, the, uh, I was just going to say, I didn't know. I, I, I know that, for example, if you are convicted of something, um, let's say, I don't know, theft over 5000 you you pay your fine, you, you whatever. After a certain number of years, your record is cleared. I don't know how many it is. If you're convicted? Yeah. No, it's permanent. It's permanent? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's that, never cleared? Never cleared. It, unless, you, unless you seek out a pardon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so if you're charged and you're not convicted, it's cleared at a certain point, no? No, stays never. there. So, what so you're never, you're, <laughs> if you're ever charged, yeah. regardless of what happens, you're never cleared except for now if you're found innocent wait, wait. Or, or it's thrown out. Right. and It, and it, it disappears. And, and we have to remember, the burden is always on the government. The government has to establish proof beyond a reasonable doubt for somebody to be convicted. So it's not that we have to prove innocence. The Crown hasn't established the case, and so they're acquitted at trial or discharged at a preliminary inquiry or charges are withdrawn. Those cases cannot further stigmatize an individual when they are innocent. The only issue that we see in this legislation are two, are two points. One, sorry, I'm talking too much. Um, <laughs> Is, That's not new. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, it's great because you're passionate about it. Because this has been a major problem for clients of ours. So in, in there's a um, sense of, I forgot what they call them, but vulnerable sector checks. So for people working with children or volunteering with children, mm -hmm. this can affect teachers. So records can still be disclosed in certain instances in those uh, cases. That has to be reviewed carefully, too, upon disclosure, because somebody can be wrongly accused of something for many reasons. We've had cases where we've established fabrication, where we've established a motive to lie, and unfortunately the evidence was not true. And this person went through hell, frankly, a, a, a never-ending nightmare for a couple of years. Their career, whatever it is, whether it's in teaching or working with a children's organization, should not be hampered if they are innocent. And so we have to take a careful look at that. 
So ha when did this go into effect, or when does it go into effect? This, this uh, the change. It, the change. Well, it's passed now, mm -hmm. passed Tuesday mm -hmm. by the legislature. So one would assume that if I went in to apply for a very sensitive job tomorrow, but yeah. mind you, I don't have any record, but... But somebody who did. Somebody's right. gone, yeah. Somebody yeah. who went in tomorrow that from now on, that everybody knows, every small police department, everybody knows that nothing, or do, or are the records just wiped clean on a computer? It's it's not. It, it'll remain on the computer. Why don't you answer this? Because yeah. I talk way too much. <laughs> no, it'll, it will <laughs> remain on the database. And But there's just limits on what the police can disclose to potential employers. And part of the problem and part of the reason for this new legislation is that there was no uniformity between you know, between jurisdictions when it came. So, you know, some uh, jurisdictions may release only convictions, but others would release, you know, results that were resulted in an acquittal or when the charges were withdrawn. So now at least there's uniformity, and it, it, as Joseph has said very eloquently, it protects people's rights in a much greater, to a much greater extent. Yeah. So let me just ask one more question here, which is why does it need to still be in the database? Uh, I mean, if it's not do, going to be disclosed. If it's not ever going to be disclosed, do police need to know that somebody was charged, and it, but it was a mischief charge? Do, just well, in case something else comes up, does it alert them or what? Well, it's not that it's never going to be disclosed. I mean, there's diff now there's going to be different levels of checks too, right? So um, if a vulnerable sector check is done, the non-conviction result may still show up and it may still have an effect on someone who's applying, for example, you know, to be a nurse or someone who works with the elderly or works mm -hmm. with children. Like, it can still come up. And, and here's the other issue. The police, and, and we can't be negative on the police services completely because some police services have had very good policies in Toronto Police too about certain types of offenses where after an acquittal or a charge is withdrawn within a period of time, you can write to them to what we call purge what's on the computer system and then send it off to the RCMP to have it knocked off of CPIC, which is the Canadian Police Information System. But there are various categories of offenses, like sexual assault or mm -hmm. domestic-related offenses, children. Like if somebody or things with children. That charged, stays there. You know, fifty times with interfering with a minor, but but then it never there wasn't enough evidence or or whatever. I I I think if I were hiring them to work at a daycare, I'd want to know. Yeah, you would. But I mean, I'll just you know talk too much for one more minute. So I had a poor <laughs> client who was charged four times with domestic related uh, issues with the same former spouse. Each time acquitted. The fourth time, you know, I nearly lost it because I brought a motion to say that this person no longer has credibility based upon cross-examinations from the three other occasions. And again, the fourth time was acquitted. Uh, but those records remained. Yeah, and it no, was yeah, one of those, no, and, and right. I'm not, no, and I don't right. mean, you're and again, right. I don't want to be negative. It's, it's, I'm not saying that all these allegations are not correct. I'm sure it, it, there are proper allegations, but in a certain cases where somebody is wrongly accused, not once, not twice, but four times, four times those yeah. records mm -hmm. ought to be purged, and this person shouldn't be no longer be stigmatized because, unfortunately, due to you know mm -hmm. somebody who's not well and keeps mm -hmm. charging them with silly things. Wow. Well, that sounds. That is actually that's really interesting, and it is an important piece of. of yeah. This is really very, of all the news we're talking important. about. You know, this this is really important for uh, for Canadians. A lot of people. A lot of people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's great well, news. It's been great to hear from both of you. Thank you. Come by both. More of you. me, I guess. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, she won't invite me. Next time. <laughs> you're both welcome anytime to come and join us. It's been a pleasure. That's today's legal beat, brought to you by Newberger and Partners LLP, one of Canada's leading criminal defense law firms, expertly defending clients since 1992. Visit them online at nrlawyers.com. Click the channel subscribe button for full-length interviews and more from what she said here on YouTube.